I, I think we all should be concerned in our lives about are we caring and concerned about others enough? I think that's a fair statement. I think it's also a fair statement that you have to work a little bit more consciously about that kind of issue of showing empathy and being concerned with others. Because I think the cost in the behavior growing up is that you didn't see it modeled except for your mother. Thank goodness your mom was just richly empathic and she was emotionally aware and all those things were who she was. But you know, you're a male and you do identify more significantly with your father simply because of that perspective, that developmental issue. And it's a huge one. Testimony continued today in the most notorious criminal trial in Richland County history. Dr. John Boyle is accused of killing his wife, Noreen, and burying her body in the basement of his new home in Erie, Pennsylvania. The 12-year-old son finally took the stand. As I heard a scream, I heard a thud. It was about this loud. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty. When I was 12 years old, my testimony sent my father to prison for murdering my mother. This podcast serves as a type of therapy and reconciliation for myself. And it is my hope that it helps anyone who has experienced deception, betrayal, and dark trauma. I'm Collier Landry, and this is Moving Past Murder. Hey, movers, welcome back to another episode of Moving Past Murder. I'm your host, Collier Landry, and what's going on? Well, I'll tell you what, what is going on today? So uh, I have been engaging in a lot of talk lately about narcissism and sociopathy and all of these things with a lot of my friends, mostly because there's been just so much true crime out there that people are consuming that has um, really brought a lot of these things, behaviors to light. Last week I touched upon the Dahmer uh, show on Netflix and the psychopathy and learning that my father was really a psychopath. So a lot of these uh, things are just coming up in conversations that I'm having with people. And one of the things that I um, I get asked about a lot is in my film, A Murder in Mansfield, the psychologist that I work with on camera in the film, his name is Dr. Dennis Marikis. And everyone talks about what an amazing therapist he, ha he was in the film and the insights that he sort of gleans into uh, narcissism, especially, and going into with how I can cope with my father. And overcoming those challenges, right? And it's been really inspirational to a lot of people. And today I wanna to revisit that episode. I had him on about 30 episodes ago almost. And I wanna bring that episode back here in sort of a replay style for today or a rebroadcast rather. And um, so I'm gonna play that interview that I had with him. It was about 50 minutes. It's a fantastic interview. And Dennis Merkis is a fantastic individual. But of course, I want to thank all of you for tuning into another episode, for liking and subscribing on YouTube. Thank you for everyone who is subscribing via Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And thank you so much for your really glowing reviews, which have been coming in in, in greater fashion these days. And I, obviously, you guys are really gravitating towards the material that I am sharing with you. And that makes me feel really good as a content creator. So Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Also, special shout out to those of you on my Patreon. Thank you for your support. We are doing another meet and greet this month, uh, October, which will be on around October 20th, I believe. So if you are not a part of my Patreon and you want to be a part of these live meet and greets and get exclusive extra content, please subscribe. It is patreon.com forward slash call your Landry. So I want to go to this week's listener question of the week. And my God, I could do an entire episode on this, but I'm just going to answer the question pretty basic, which for me, as you know, if you listen to this, brevity is not my specialty, but I'm going to try. So this comes from Chris B on YouTube. And Chris B says, what was it like to be a foster kid? My dad was a foster kid. Well, um, Chris, uh, it was not fun. <laughs> um, the foster care system in the United States, no matter who you are, is not a great system. And um, you know, I have a lot of friends that do a lot of really amazing work, not only back in my home state of Ohio or in my hometown of Mansfield, Ohio and Richland County, who are doing some really great things. You know, obviously, there is a massive opioid crisis, which has affected 
all corners of the globe, really, but has taken a, a particularly heavy hit on um, my home state of Ohio. And uh, a lot of kids are finding themselves in foster care situations where, um, you know, the parents aren't able to take care of them because they have fallen victim to um, addiction. And that is a real problem. My case was different. My father murdered my mother. So, uh, and because no family members stepped up, I went into the foster care system. So I was essentially orphaned. But, uh, you know, nowadays these kids are becoming orphaned because of addiction issues with their parents. And it's really tragic. Um, I always say to people, you know, um, yeah, it's a complicated system. And uh, as the judicial system is in this country, so is the foster care and adoption system. It is um, a, a good system at times, but it is very broken, but is probably still the best in the world. Um, it's tough. Uh, but yes, being in foster care, not, I think for me, the, the, the most challenging thing about being in foster care is the insecure footing that you have in foster care, because you're just a foster child. You don't really have a home anymore. And you, just, I mean, it, it is an uneasy feeling to not know where you're ever going to live because at a moment's notice, you can be taken out of that foster care situation or the foster parents can say they don't want you anymore. So it is a, it is a really scary reality to live with that. And I lived with that growing up for about nine months. It is on top of all the trauma that I was dealing with is also just not knowing where I'm going to end up. And I think when you go through massive trauma, you are always, you are struggling to find a footing. And it is really hard to get your footing when you're constantly in limbo. So that would be my take on being a foster care kid. And that is sort of what we're going to talk about today with Dennis Marikis. Again, this is a rebroadcast from a earlier episode about 30 episodes ago, but the information that he and I discuss is so key and people ask me about it all the time. So I wanted to bring this episode out again. Please enjoy this interview and we'll see you next week. So, hey, Dennis, uh, thank you so much for joining us. I, I, I appreciate your time. Well, it's quite an honor to be with you again, as I really look forward to seeing you again, Collier. And <laughs> it's always so, so wonderful to see you. Yeah. Oh, likewise, likewise. And, you Thanks. know, I when I reached out to you on the podcast, I told you yeah. uh, that you have quite a fan base <laughs> mm. that has emerged um, with the work that we, you know, we showed on camera. And, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things that we were just, you know, discussing and is sort of and in, in the moment when you and I were there talking about my issues and what was going right. on is we, we really kept the authenticity high because mm -hmm. it was just... A natural meeting. I mean, I had not seen you since I was 11 years old. I think. Right. Yeah, I think that's so right. For our listeners and and even for me, what? So if you could take us back to that day, which was January 25th, 1990, when you came to Discovery School. I was doing some work at Discovery School, working with some of the kids as they were struggling. And then this event occurred and everything was so centered on the challenges it created. And they looked at you, I think, in some respects, and they were concerned about its impact and whether you were, should we talk to you or not? And there were some concerns about how, how fragile you were. I don't think they knew you because that's not you. You weren't fragile. It was upsetting, horrifically upsetting. There's no question about that. But the issue was what I saw in that 11 year old is a, is a person that was clear, directed, focused, and a remarkably resilient because in that short time, you know, clearly the biggest loss was your mother, but you did lose your father. You really did lose your father. You lost your dog. You lost your sister. You lost your home. And this amazing 11 year old with all that as the backdrop, knowing that he was going to testify in court at some point was clear and defined and very resilient. I think that that may be a gift that Noreen gave you, maybe, but clearly it, it's just who you are. And as you've approached other challenges, you realize there's this fortitude in you 
that I think it's dispositional. I think it's just kind of built in you. I know the situations, certainly, you know, when we build resilience, we build resilience by facing tough stuff. But there's some people, and I think you're clearly one of those, that don't really have difficulties looking at tough stuff and saying, I got to do something about this. Even your podcast reflects that, helping others. And I think that's really key. So back then, um, you were a, you were a, even you had a great sense of humor. You were a guy that that typically, even in the midst of all this, could talk like an adult with with no problematic pattern. You spoke like an adult. I'm sure, you know, the time you spent with your mom and, and the environment made that pretty clearly easier for you. You were grieving, but you're also there was part of you that said, you know, I'm going to move forward. I felt you felt so directed in what you were doing. And I think that was really a strength of yours. And, you know, everyone else was just stunned by all the events. But it was more than that for you. You you focused on, I want to protect, I want to help as best I can. At that time, we didn't know what happened to your mom. Uh, I want to do the most I can do, you know, so that mom uh, feels that, that you are in her corner and that we're trying to help her. And I think that's what you did. Wow, that's really powerful. Well, first of all, that's amazing to hear um, yeah. that I had an impact at that time on you and that there were these key indicators. I mean, so that I was going to be okay, I guess. Yeah, it, it, yeah. One of the crazy things about doing the podcast is... You know, as as you know, I was like abandoned by my entire family, my mother's yes. side and my father's side. That's right. And th having lost my mother and my home and my dog and my, you know, my whole way of life, right? I, I, I've i reconnected with some of these relatives. And oh, you like have? TikTok. Yeah, because they saw the New York Post article that came out, you know, a month, not even a month ago. Then they saw, you know, they started listening to the podcast or they followed me on TikTok and they just started reaching out. And it was interesting because they weren't immediate relatives. They were, uh, you know, one of them was married to my father's cousin, my father's first cousin, but knew my mother. And there's two th wonderful things about it. And my mother's side of the family that are like doing genealogies have reached out to me. And oh, gosh. it's really amazing. One of the things that is the general sentiment from everyone is, first of all, they can't understand why nobody stepped up in the family and they were distant relatives. So they weren't in that. They were like, why didn't your immediate, why didn't your mom's sister take you? Why didn't your father's right. brother take you? Right. Why didn't these people step up? And, you know, what was going on? Right. On the flip side, they have these wonderful remembrances of my mother. Oh. And they'll say things like, God, I watched the podcast and I watch you on camera. And it's like seeing your mother. It's like a, it's, it's a, you're so much like your mother. You are. And then of course they have all these wonderful stories about her right. uh, of just that, you know, like when I made the film, I didn't realize that my mother had put my father through medical school, you know, and right. finding out all right. these things was really crazy yeah. because I didn't grow up knowing that. Um, so that was really cool. And the impact that my mother had on these people right. was probably the most interesting because what they said is they said, we didn't know what happened to you. Mm -hmm. And we always wondered, but we knew because you were Noreen's son, you were going to figure it out. Isn't That's that powerful. something? It That's is powerful. Mm. That's powerful. That's the impact that my mother had on yes. relatives that are, you know, distant relatives, but they all said, you know, wherever this kid is, he's, he's going to be okay because that's mm -hmm. Noreen's son. Mm -hmm. That's so heartwarming to hear. It is uh, and isn't such it? a tribute yeah. to my mother, right. um, which is just, you know, which is, makes me smile Yeah. on the flip side. <laughs> right. There are the same relatives that obviously had experiences with my father. And yes. I guess one of the things that I, you know, I did this episode about my birthday. I turned 44 a couple of days ago. And that was the, the age my mother was killed. Thank oh, you so right. much. Yeah. <laughs> um, the real birthday is actually happening tomorrow, which is uh, which will be uh, March 5th, because that's when my little dog, Blondie, turns 17. Oh, my goodness. 
Yes. So that is cool. the one we're celebrating in my mind. <laughs> yeah, gotcha, gotcha. But are you um, somewhat conscious about aging? Do you do you think? Well, I think that what I was what I was conscious about is the fact that this is when my mother turned forty four. So yes. that was a milestone for me. Actually, it she is. was murdered at forty four. And then right. the next milestone will be like my father when he was 46 right. getting arrested and murdering my mother and all that. So that happens. So I, I one of the things I want to ask you right. is it, you know, with the flip side with my father, there's the bad things, right? There's all these wonderful things and traits about my mother. But then my father has traits and I obviously half of his blood courses my veins sure. and I think that a lot of people, when they reach out to me on the podcast um, and after seeing the film and our work in the film and seeing my father, right. they wonder, is this something that is hereditary? Mm. Is his sociopathy? And I know you like to, you don't want to, you, you stray away from that term because it's not right. recognized, but um, our traits that my father exhibits, the narcissism, the and and I don't know if he's a covert narcissist or he's an overt narcissist or a little bit of both, but the, the these traits are these something that people who have relatives or that have grown up with this have a have a danger of repeating. What are your thoughts on that? Is that something yeah, you should be worried I, about? Uh, I mean, I, I think we all should be concerned in our lives about are we caring and concerned about others enough. I think that's a fair statement. I think it's also a fair statement that you have to work a little bit more consciously about that kind of issue of showing empathy and being concerned with others. Because I think the cost in the behavior growing up is that you didn't see it modeled except for your mother. Thank goodness your mom was just richly empathic and she was emotionally aware and all those things were who she was. But you know, you're a male and you do identify more significantly with your father simply because of that perspective, that developmental issue. And it's a huge one. So I do think when you decide how to be a man, your primary person growing up really was your father. You understood caring and concern about others from your mother. That in itself probably facilitates you not having those challenges. If your mom was absent and distant, the chances are you identifying more with your father would have been more significant. So there's a little bit of research that supports that there are some of those uh, pre-existing sort of characteristics that may come from narcissism with a narcissistic parent. But most of it is the environment and the situations you dealt with growing up. And so you could always look at your father's behavior and say there's something wrong with it because you had your mother because you knew what it was like to feel connected and emotionally aware i think though we always have to be aware of our vulnerabilities and the vulnerability probably you do have is that identification with how to be a man i mean you've clearly you're in a different place now at age 44 than you were at age 18 20 21 25 but clearly some of it is there and i think some of your struggles you'd have to say mm, yeah it looks a little like that nothing like what your father did but or how he acted i mean it was the most remarkable thing of course was the awful things uh, he had done with your mom the awful stuff not just leading up to her death but well before that but he also did terrible things to you he also yeah. was really really I mean, uh, shared his aggression and that more, I don't know if he was more overt with his aggression, although it's not unusual for narcissists to present as if they have no trouble and that in the world and seen as a very benevolent, caring person, but at home really wreck havoc. That's not unusual. He, he did sort of a bit of both, um, uh, meaning that he had some characteristics that would say he wanted to present well. Uh, but the second aspect of it was that he also wasn't able to sustain that in relationships, just was never there. So I do think in, in, in a long winded answer, I do think that, yeah, I think we have to be attentive to that. But I also think you have good models to help you see perspective differently, which is great. I, mean, I guess I could ask you that question. Do you fear sometimes the, some of those characteristics that you saw in your dad and you? I would say that growing up yeah. um, after 
the murder. Mm-hmm. And going like when I made the transition from going to private school to public school, I was bullied mm-hmm. a lot. Yeah. Didn't make a big deal out of it. Um, but I was bullied a lot. And I was not like a small like kid. You know, right. I was a sizable, you know, yeah. I mean, I, I could kick someone's ass. Yeah, yeah. I would get angry, but I would let it just I wouldn't fight back. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't engage because there was a part of me that was very concerned that a switch could be flipped. Right. Because I grew up seeing my father having his switch flipped like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He would go into fits of rage and anger over nothing, nothing. (laughs) And I remember a specific time I was wearing a hat that the ski instructor had given me. It said Penn State. Now, my father graduated Mm -hmm. from Wharton, University of Pennsylvania, Quakers. Mm -hmm. And I said, Penn State. And he goes, you shouldn't, you can't say that. Don't say that. We hate Penn State. And I was like, oh, Penn State, you know, nine years old, eight years old. What kids do, right, right, yeah. Yeah, what kids do, acting like a little obnoxious kid. Yeah, (laughs) that's right. Surprise, surprise. Um, (laughs) And uh, it it seems to have translated well into adulthood. Um, (laughs) And we have this, you know, so I'm making this and then he just gets enraged and he's screaming at me and my mother is pleading for my life and he, breaks the windows in the door and he's screaming at her, pointing at her, smacking her, like just anger. And just, it was so terrifying mm-hmm. over me. And you beg for his forgiveness. Oh, I'm going to kill this kid. You, I beg, you will beg. And she's pleading with him. It was just, it was one of the most dramatic things I had ever oh, seen from gosh. my father. And she's crying and she's pleading, Jack, don't hurt him. Jack, don't do this. Um, and it's like, you know, and I testified to that uh, trial. So right. getting back to what I was saying, I would always question if I, if that switch flipped, could that light be turned off quickly, mm-hmm. easily? Mm-hmm. Could I come out and just be aggressive and all of my pent up aggression, if you will, of my, you know, First of all, I'm a teenager, so I'm already having an angsty time in general. Oh, Forget sure. what happened to me. I'm, I'm a teenager. Teenage right. boys are probably the best examples of sociopaths in the world. Oh, sure. You know, Self-interested, self-focused. Yeah, sure. You know what I mean? There's a, there's for sure. It goes with it. Yep, yep, uh, yeah, yep. it comes with the territory. So I already have this angsty teenager inside, coupled with the fact that my whole life had been turned upside down a few <sighs> years earlier and all of this other stuff. And then what had happened to me on top of it and who my father was. So there's a lot of elements at play. So I never really get it so back to your question was right. did i worry about that yes i worried about that a lot yeah. and i have gotten over that fear yeah. in adulthood um i know that i'm not that type of person i don't have right. those proclivities to anger and irrational behavior mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that my father had and right. just at the flip of the switch but i do want to go back to something that you were saying earlier which is right. my you know uh, the narcissism and my the way my father behaved. There were so many people. And if you look at like the trial and they raised a fund for him, they raised all this money. I used to go with my father on his rounds uh, as a medical doctor. And mm-hmm. I, um, I definitely, uh, sorry, now the phone just beeped, which is insane. Um, the uh i would go on my father's medical rounds with him and i saw what a a great doctor he was and how he interacted Mm -hmm. with patients and so when my father was charged with murdering his wife um a lot of people didn't know he was married (laughs) first of all Uh. second of all they they had this sort of state of disbelief like how this is dr boyle he's this great doctor he's helped me with my cancer he's helped me with this he treats me for disability from the gm plant he does and he's a great doctor this man is incapable of this right do you feel because of his extension of being a doctor that you know, I think Jim Mayer, the prosecutor, said in his closing argument, he was a killer by day, a healer by day, killer by night, right? Right. So do you feel that in the position my father was selectively, almost like the selective empathy, where right. he would go to the patients and, and, and the families, and I would go to my father with like, we go to Amish country, 
And I learned a lot about, and of course, mm-hmm. me being a little entertainer, I was like tap dancing and playing this little harmonica and singing yeah. and being patient. I can see my, that. <laughs> my nature. Um, but I remember specifically, there was a place not too far from you. I don't know if it still exists. It was called the Rain Tree. Yeah. Where they had children with right. disabilities, uh, extreme disabilities that required, right. you know, um, what is the word? Paleotic or mm-hmm. pa- 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 what is it? Paleotic or. You know, you know what, what I mean? That palliative yeah. care. Oh, right? palliative care. Palliative care. Yeah. Yes, that's is what that, you mean. Is, yeah. that what I'm, yeah. is that what I'm saying? That's saying people that, that are typically, uh, they're not in hospice, but the care is really based on level of function and they don't really do a lot more remarkably to change the person. They facilitate making them more comfortable. Um, so I remember. Yeah. So, so I remember specifically going to the rain tree of my father and a kid, you know, who had like, you know, he was developmentally, like mentally disabled and, and it was drooling and my father was cleaning yeah. up the drool. And I remember just, I was crying. I was trying not to cry, sure. but I was, uh, I felt, you know, so bad for this child. I didn't realize at the time, I think that that was his reality. And I think that we all go through things and, you know, people say, oh, how did you handle your situation? Well, it was my reality. I just handled it. So right. he probably didn't know another reality. I think he was born that way. Mm-hmm. Um, but I remember my father he would say to me, you know, you're really blessed to have an able body and to be a, a kid that can go outside and play and all this stuff and just be grateful for that. And my mother would do right. the same thing. My mother was very big into the whole gratitude thing and, and that's really great. understanding. Wonderful. You know, mm-hmm. I think it's a great way to raise a child, by the way. Absolutely. To, 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 you know, one of my favorite things, you know, wasn't probably my favorite as a kid, but as I've entered adulthood is that my mother every year would make me go to, before Santa Claus came. And yes, I believed in Santa Claus. I literally found out about Santa Claus when I was going through the house and I found my letters to Santa Claus. And I asked <laughs> my foster mother, why did mommy have, why did my mother have this these letters from right. Santa. Why did she keep them? And then she said, well, there's no Santa Claus. Just like a matter of fact, like there's no Santa Claus call here. Oh, well, you didn't know any better. I was like, heartbreak. Yeah. I was like, great. Okay. So I've lost my mom. I lost my father. I lost my dog, lost my whole way of living. And now there's no fucking Santa Claus. No Santa Thanks. Claus. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I rem- so, I don't know where I was going with this, but I, I think well, you were talking things, about so, your dad. So, right. So right. my father, with his care that he would provide patients and right. showing that that genuine empathy in that moment mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. is that is the way that he is is that because it's self-serving oh i think there's no doubt about that that's it i i, it, I it's not unusual i'll say this broadly without i'll say it with a, with a little bit of care but concern a lot of physicians a lot of people in those healing roles do take on some of those narcissistic characteristics in part because they have some godlike complexes because they can heal somebody so we may mm-hmm. say the healer has empathy but the healer really is a problem solver he's a technician to resolve the issue and i know that's sort of a a limited way of looking at their concern for other people, but it's not unusual for somebody that has narcissistic characteristics to do that because where does the praise go? Oh, doctor, you've helped me out so much. The praise goes back to you. It's always an exchange theory. It's always back to me. So when I help somebody, I'm getting affirmation. I'm also probably earning a fairly substantial living. There's lots of factors that go with that profession, but you can sort of box it into a profession where you show empathy to the degree that you care for somebody else, but not really deeply felt. In fact, it's often taught to physicians to not show that care because it's difficult. Even in my profession, when I work at supervising counselors, it's important to set boundaries. So you really can't get so invested that you take with you the challenges of your experience. So you have to do, it's called objectifying. You have to sort of see the person, care about them, but create some distance because the pain that people are suffering, including yours, Collier, like that, you can't you can't wear with you every day and then do that work with 20 other people and maintain that. Physician has to do the same thing. So, uh, yes, there's probably some that he showed some care and concern for, no doubt about it, but it was in the context of the role of being a physician. And I think that's how I often see that kind of, like I said, sort of compartmentalized. I can be that person in that situation. 
the answer always is when I work with people with narcissistic characteristics is in those situations that you show care and concern for other people and you do it because you're whatever your profession might be or whatever your role is, you can broaden that. And your work is to broaden that even when you feel like you want to yell and scream to begin to start the process of realizing that the core to narcissism is insecurity. It, it, it's a hard one to see because they seem so remarkably confident, but the core of it is insecure. If we're to sort of take a tagline for narcissism is that I have to, in order, in order to feel good about myself, I have to prove that I'm better than you. Always, always. So a physician is better because he's the caregiver. He's providing the service, you see, and, and it's great. And I'm not saying he doesn't, he didn't show care and concern for his patients. I'm sure he did. But, you know, and, and I don't know that I can even diagnose him with narcissism. I didn't really ever work with your dad, but I right. do understand the characteristics are there based on what you experienced. So, yeah, it can be both. Yeah. Um, something that was interesting that a lot of people ask about. Yeah. Um, is... And you and I discussed this, and I don't know if it made it into the film, but you and I discussed it. And we discussed it afterwards many times. Yeah. But and you know, as I as you know, I did a TED talk about this, saying, yes. "What if the answer you seek is not the answer you need?" Mm -hmm. And one of the most poignant things that you said to me after the meeting with my father in prison, and this will always stick with me, and I tell people this because I think that people see my father stumbling through, making up lies, un trying to figure out like, weren't you angry? Weren't you this? Don't you feel left unsatisfied because he didn't admit what he did and this, that, and the other. But one of the things that you said to me very specifically is that you feel by my father not admitting mm -hmm. his guilt or a justification on why he committed the crime, a proper one, Mm -hmm. um, that that ultimately serves me better because I end up with less questions and I have a better resolution. Can you mm -hmm. talk about that a little bit? Because I, that's a really hard pill for a lot of people to swallow. It is, it is. Cause I, I think everyone's perspective is when we have this sort of moment where we have a, a come to Jesus perspective or facing that person in your life, whatever it's a parent, et cetera, you hope for the outcome to be that we'll be nice with each other for the rest of our days. We'll reconcile, we'll make it better. And in this situation, my fear for you, and it is fear for a lot of people that deal with people with these characteristics, is that you're inclined to be drawn to that. Sure. His affirmations were powerful to you more than his, his, all his negative things he said, because you kind of countered on that, because you knew that's kind of his re response to you was. So part of it by doing that allows you to see really his true nature towards you. And more importantly, it helped you realize that this was your journey. It really helps. The, the word that I would use also is forgiveness. And, and I know that's a tough word because people translate that in a lot of weird ways. But yeah, the, I want the to big talk about issue, that too. yeah, it, it is more the process of letting go. He helped you to let go a whole lot more so by being consistent or congruent with his perspective throughout this process. Had he done the opposite, and you know, you know that sometimes even in the journey with those letters, it was, they were nice, kind letters at times. There were some things that reflected a sense of connection to you. And I think yeah. that kind of brings you closer to him. That's worse. Thinking, That's this worse is my opinion. dad. Yeah. It's the Stockholm syndrome, right? Yeah. Right. 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 <laughs> There's a bit of that. Yeah. Oh, now they brought me some food. They gave me a hot shower. Right. I've been in a concrete box for the last 30 days. That's right. That's right. I haven't eaten anything. Oh, this nice person, you know, it's the good cop back. It's, it's, it's crazy and it it's um it, it's it's really really difficult but yeah um i feel very 
obviously you're being very open and honest and as am I, definitely my father would draw me in by these little right. things of praise, right? It's a way of little control. Little nuggets, these little nuggets, little nuggets. Right. Like I'm so proud of you, son. I'm so proud of this. I'm so proud of the man you become. You're the best. And then at the end of the day, you have to then take that with the grain of salt. Like, why is he saying that? Oh, because he's up for parole. Oh, right. because he wants to rescind me to rescind my testimony. Oh, I mean, as you know, the the whole thing with the film was, you know, when I when my father enters the room for that big final scene, right? He's got right. a smile on his face. He's very very excited. He's like, oh, I'm happy to be here. And he's like, hey, bump, how you doing? And as soon as I say to him. One of the things I've been interested in ever since you murdered my mother, his whole yeah, just demeanor changes right. because my father was under the impression and not because I gave him this impression. Um, I may have let him run with it, but I most certainly didn't say this is why I'm doing this dad. Mm -hmm. He felt that I was making a film to help him get out of prison. So he was yep. very excited to share his side of the story right. and right. how wonderful he's been doing in prison with all of his accolades and, and got his degree in theology or his master's in theology and all of these things. And he's doing this work with grief recovery for the other inmates, which by the way, I mean, I know that he is making an impact there. And for that, I am grateful. I mean, Absolutely. I don't think it impacts him at all, but it does. Right. I, I, I did meet several inmates that felt that the work that he had done with them had really helped them come to terms with their own crimes and their yeah. own, you know, uh, come to terms with their, their, their impact on other victims. Mm -hmm. Um, which is, which is something that I feel like is commendable in a lot of ways. Oh, absolutely. Because, uh, you know, at least you're doing something good. At least it is impacting some people. And I heard that right. firsthand. So give credit where credit is due. That is a fantastic thing. Oh, it's also absolutely. the prison that he's in, in Marion Correctional Institution. Um, they sort of push those types of things. They, they mm -hmm. are not push, but they have an environment that allows those types of things right. to occur, which is also right. despite my father's inability to be reformed, as we say, I still feel really good about the work that is done right. there at that facility because they mm -hmm. do allow space for that, which I feel is massive in anyone, uh, who is trying to change their life after committing such a violent and horrible crime. Right. Right. So uh, for that, I'm very grateful to them. Sure. What I want to, you know, what like, a lot of these people have asked, and you know, I, a lot of these questions come from readers or psychologists right. that have seen the film and gone, "This guy's amazing again, oh, amazing," kind, and they just, kind, they just, let, you're kind. like a little celebrity yeah. in their world. They're like, "This oh, is the boy. best." One of them said, "This is the best child psychologist I have ever seen in my life." Like. Oh Who my. is he? Is he still practicing? What is he doing? Yeah. It's amazing. And so thank you for that and, and, sure. and everything that you contributed to the film and to my my personal growth. Um, yeah, you're but welcome. what they wanted, to, a lot of the questions that I get is given the dynamic with my father, is it possible for an individual who is going through dealing with someone who's a narcissist, sociopath, right. dealing with these qualities in a person, in another person, as you know, we just came through the pandemic, people are really realizing who they're cooped up with these days. Exactly. Um, uh, is it possible to even to have some sort of relationship or is it just all bets are off? This is never going to change. Can you speak to that a little bit? Because that's sure. a big burning question. It's a really big one. And I want to get back to the notion of what your father is doing. And again, we're not diagnosing him. That's clearly the case. But what we find is that when the environment is controlled and you don't have the capacity to have personal relationships as easily, to have a sense of life outside of that role, they typically do better. I mean, they do. So I hate to say it, but as, as, as it is common, prison for people who have those skills, like your father had as a physician, uh, really do better in those environments. And so they can manifest more effective behavior. It doesn't mean that 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 won't sure. flip when if he were to be released. But clearly, that's what happens. My role is a healer. And so and that's probably all my role. I mean, I don't have relationships in the same way. I don't have a family in the same way. I don't have those things. So sometimes people with that characteristic pattern can do well in those controlled environments to reflect that they can then 
use that controlled environment and now expand it to a world like he had prior to going to prison is another issue. It's just another issue. And the dynamic, uh, it just simply doesn't carry as well. So I do think that's some of what we're, we're looking at here. Uh, you, you had a question with that beyond that, and I got stuck on that notion. What was your other No, but question? I think that was great. I think that was yeah. uh, great. And that does, you know, serve the role. I think that yeah. people were just curious, how can you, how do you, when you're stuck with someone like that in your life, right. how do you, do you just have to make the conscious, conscientious decision of just saying, I'm just shutting this off in my yeah. brain. I'm, I'm going, well, much like I have. Like you this did, is, you know, right. And, and like I say in the film, you know, one of the things that was really cool is a New York Times reporter had seen the film hmm. and he said, hey, here's the thing. And I didn't, even, I wasn't even prepared for him to say this, but it was, and I was like, I did. He said to me, he goes, the thing that stuck out the most to me, to mm -hmm. me in the film is after you have this whole scene with your father, you get up, you hug him and you say, I love you, pop. Yeah. He's like, I want you to, to sort of, he's like, that to me was the moment that spoke the most about your character as a person. That's absolutely it is. who you yep. are. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, thank you. I was like, I didn't really look at it that way. I just, that's just me, you know, that's just how I am. And I'm not mm -hmm. going to go with hate. And I do want to get into the subject of forgiveness because this is very key. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think it's a nice segue is I say that to him because that's my natural response. Mm -hmm. But I've made the decision after hearing everything. And I say, you know, I, I believe that you believe that. And there's my answer. How, let me go back a little bit. When my father was convicted and sentenced uh -huh. by, um, uh, judge Henson, um, James Henson served as the uh, criminal you know, judge on mm -hmm. the case. Um, he called me into his chambers after the sentencing mm -hmm. and everything. And I was sitting there and he, he got into sort of this diatribe about how, and I, and I love Jim Henson. I thought he was, yeah. he did a great yeah, job and, and I think he's a great person. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, he goes, you can't, forgive unless you can forget so then you can never forgive and he gave me this whole speech about forgiveness and i just remember at the time thinking to myself well that's bullshit yeah and and it has to be bullshit because i am never going to forget the fact no. that my father no. murdered my mother right i will never forget that no no <laughs> Never for a split second of probably no. even if I had Alzheimer's, I wouldn't forget that. <laughs> no. So, no, 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 it, no, Because no, It no. is such a monumental right. thing in your life. Right. So when he said that, I was just like, that just doesn't work for me. And I'm going to have to figure out a way because I can't forget this and no. forgiveness cannot be tied to this. Right. No, it can't. No, and that's right. I think it's the other tethered. way around. Yeah. Right. And I think, the, you know, and, and even some people, even before when I made the film, they were, they were trying to understand, you know, how can you forgive your father? It's just so heinous. Right. Like, how can you, how do you forget that? Like, it's just, how can you forgive somebody that does that? And I, and I'm like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, guys, you're, you're thinking about this the wrong way. Mm -hmm. You're thinking that by me forgiving him, I am somehow excusing him for what That's he right. did. Right. Which is not the case. Nope. But, but by forgiving him, I take away all the power that that has over That's it. me. You got I'm it perfectly. I'm taking all of that back and owning That's it right. and saying, I have a choice right here, right now. I can hate this man. It's, it's, you know, and it's, and it's, you know, and you know, I'm sober. I quit drinking a couple of years ago. And one of the things that a lot of people say in the poison or, or say, say in the program is they'll say, you know, or this is maybe where I heard it in the room somehow is, you know, it's like drinking poison, expecting the other person to die, right? And I That's know that it. these these cliche sayings, but it's very true in this. It's like, really true. My father, if I, and I have, well, I mean, my mother's side of the family, my immediate cousins who were molested and, you know, one of them sadly took her own life a few years ago. And mm -hmm. I, and I, I understand that she had problems, but I'm sure that what happened to her as a child did not help things whatsoever. No. Didn't, um, you, didn't you say that uh, your father was accused of that behavior? Was yeah, that? my father was, my father was going I mean, to be arrested. We found right. out, but the, right. the girls 
couldn't go through with testifying. This is so either. traumatic, and yeah, it is traumatic. And I and my heart breaks for them. And mm -hmm. and in no way is you know, I mean, obviously, if he was arrested, he wouldn't kill my mother. But in no way is that their cross to bear. <laughs> no, or, like you, you know, it's 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 they were reacting how they reacted. It, my father sure. was solely to blame for all of this. Oh gosh, um, and all of this and, and the tragedy is, so is the. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I'm saying the tragedy of it all is, is who suffers, right? The victim. The victim suffers the most in those situations of trauma. You know that more than anybody. Um, and, the, and the tragic perspective is they carry that burden of what it means to go through a trauma of abuse. And uh, yeah, that is the, that is, I see that far, far too often in my practice that, that the victimization continues to occur. Uh, sure. And it's hard in that situation to address it differently. But like I said, it's no easier for you, Collier, and you have done a remarkable job of finding that space. Now, I want to come back to what you said when you when they were talking about you hugging your father and forgiveness, because I do think it was the gesture of forgiveness, but it is the suggestion of saying goodbye. You yeah, said 100%. goodbye to him. Yeah, you said goodbye to him. It's, and it brings sadness in my heart to see that, that you'd have to say goodbye to your father and it wouldn't be on his deathbed. It wouldn't be when he dies. It's that you had to say goodbye to him because of what he did. And, and, and in my heart, that's where forgiveness really is. Like you said, is exactly right. Forgiveness main, is maintained. The process of not forgiving is maintained within the individual, not the situation anymore. So I yes. hold on to that. And so Judge Hudson, who I love deeply, uh, I think he flipped it. I think it's the other way around. You'll never forget, but you can forgive. That's true. I believe that if forgiveness is defined by letting go and not reconciliation or making things all right, because that's not the core of forgiveness. Sometimes people reconcile those forgiven relationships. But in this situation, it would I feared for you if you did, because I know the influence and the challenge and the concerns that he would create for you would be continued and i think your goal was very clear that that's why the movie was so powerful because it helped you come to the journey of saying i'm letting you go i'm never going to forget what you did i'm letting you go i'm letting you go the hold that you had over me to want to be a father to me to have that father-son relationship that's what you let go of as much as a concept than the individual do you know what i mean i mean it's more the sense I, I desperately want a loving father. So you would make it up. You would show how he could be loving when he wasn't. Now, I'm, I'm not saying he wasn't at times, but you would do that. And so part of the work in this situation is saying, I'm letting go of that hold that he had over me to be drawn to, to draw towards that. To, like you said, like the Stockholm Syndrome, to, to have something at an emotional level to eat and drink, to feel that sense of presence, that appetite for him. Yeah, absolutely. And I thought that was clearly the most, I'm glad you did that because you took charge. You said, I'm letting you go. And, and, and I thought that was exactly what that was representing. And I thought, that's really a beautiful way to do it. You could say, well, screw you, buddy. I don't want any more to do with you. You know, you're just a terrible man. But you didn't. You said, Dad, I forgive you. I let go of you. And and I just think that's really the most powerful piece. And I, I think that's a practice that many of us need to do. We hold on to vengeances, regardless of the level and the nature and the challenge. We just hold on to those. And somehow we think, we're going to get we're going to get some, you know, I, even the legal system, as much as I find that sometimes can be helpful, it's not going to lead towards forgiveness. It just doesn't. There may be some justice with it that helps, but you carry that stuff with you until sure. you decide to let it go. And, and you did. And you did in, in a very remarkable way, I think. Just remarkable. Well, thank you. Um, sure. And thank you for being a big part of that. Well, that's really great of you to say. Thanks. Um, yeah, it's, um, however, <laughs> yeah. it doesn't make it any less sad. No, it's, it is the most tragic of stories. It is your life going through that yes i mean you can 
I mean, he's still my father. He's still your father. And it's never an absolute perspective. It's never, it's done. I have forgiven him. No, it recycles in different parts of your life, Collier, when you face different challenges too. And and it, like I, I said that before, and I don't, you know, I, I, it's sad to say, but you lost so much, but you've also gained so much, but you've lost so much. You realize that the presence of your mom was such a, an incredible loss, but your presence with your mom is with you most of the time. I think you know that. I think you feel a sense of her, not in kind of a, well, some might be kind of a spiritual way, but I think it's just the qualities that you bring at times you feel that presence with her and you'd rather have her, you'd rather have the flesh and bones. Oh gosh. You'd rather have her sitting the next to you right now. Of course, of course. But that sense of it is really where you are. You bring her with you as you deal with challenging situations, as you deal with loving situations. It, it's just the sadness that is so powerful, it, but powerful towards your father, too. I mean, you would love to have had him be a loving, caring father. I would take just not being an asshole. And not being an asshole would be good, too. Yeah. <laughs> don't kill my mother. You know, yeah, I mean, don't, this is, yeah, it's don't, absurd don't, to say that. Yeah. Uh, uh, let's just start with that. You don't have to be, yeah, I mean, you don't have to be yeah. loving, caring. Yeah. I mean, I have plenty of friends whose right. parents are very detached from their lives right you know and and you know uh, yeah their parents might be wealthy and they cut checks but you know and that's yeah, a wonderful thing as a yeah. struggling artist that's an amazing thing to be able to have that it support is. from family it members is. and be like yeah. hey yeah we really support what you're doing here's some money um but the, that support is veiled in the in for that particular example is veiled with material things right. is mailed veiled by material things that that are, are that have no real substance no. <laughs> you know i think no. that that anyone i know that has been through those situations would much rather have a parent that loves and supports them and 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 says you know and and rallies behind them or has been there in their lives and just be like here you know oh you, you need your school paid for yeah no problem you need this sure. okay yeah just sure. leave me alone don't bother me and I think that's very sad. And I think that that it is. in and of itself induces another sort of trauma. Is right. it like my trauma? Not really, no. But it is Not another really. form of of, it is. of dealing with these people and and understanding the challenges that lie within that. Right, right. I, I, I made it sound like, and I think that's the difference in terms of level of trauma. And it can be traumatic to go through a, a parent's going through a divorce and the parent who you reside with, the other parent does not get active in your life at all. So it, it works in the same way. You work on forgiveness issues, but now we have to magnify it hundredfold based on what you've been through. I mean, this, you, you really were not given a situation where you could say, okay, so that used to be my life. So this is my life. Now you didn't really know what life would look like and how it would unfold. And I think that's why it was so hard. It's, it makes it even harder to let go of your father because he was the only one who ha was a piece of your life still in a weird way. You know, he, he was a person who created this loss, but also uh, was your father who was the only semblance of family that you had left at that point. So it's far different than say a kid going through a divorce, but it's similar in that forgiveness is necessary there too. I just think, I, I keep saying it. I think you're remarkable in your ability to be able to find yourself. Thanks. And I, I give that to you. I also give a little bit to Noreen too. She was so lot to <laughs> clear about uh, really loving your uniqueness. That's the one thing I remember. One of the things I remember was was how she very much loved who you were in all your quirky, unique stuff that you did as an adolescent, as a young kid. I got that. And that was that was very clear to me. And so that unconditional love is not something that goes away ever, really, because it really it truly was unconditional. She loved you unconditionally. That's a wonderful thing. Yeah, the filmmaker in me would just say, hey, we'll leave it at that. Yeah. I do want to say one more thing because it's been sure. sticking in my mind and I've said it continually throughout my life. 
not very often and probably not even very publicly. When I think back, when, when I see where I am now, right? Yeah. And when I think back to how everything unfolded, and this goes back to the, the, the thing when this guy said to me, I was in the Dominican Republic and this, this guy said, had said this to me, we were, I was filming motorcycle stunt riders and they were trying to really grasp at this whole forgiveness thing. How do you right. just let that go type of thing. Um, I said to them, it's very hard to hate someone mm -hmm. and also to not forgive someone who you feel simultaneously destroyed your life and saved it at the same yes. time. Yes. Yeah. It's really a good way of looking at it. It's very insightful. Right. Because to me, when I think about that, I don't let my circumstances define me and I never have, mm -hmm. but I'll be damned if I didn't think that because of what happened to me, it has made me the person who I am and it has allowed <laughs> me to have a platform that speaks to people That's right. that then helps them, right? That ultimately helps me right. and create a film, do a TED talk on Dr. Philip, write books to travel around the world. I mean, these are amazing experiences that I had. Right. Life could have gone an entirely different direction for me. Right. Exactly. And I, and I, and I think that one of the biggest things with my life, and I talked about this, I was interviewed in the independent a couple weeks ago about the podcast. And so one of my things growing up was <laughs> I did not, I, I wanted to get out of Mansfield because I didn't want to be known as the Boyle kid. Like, there you come. Right. Here. I wanted to define right. my life on my own terms. And also mm -hmm. I like, so I came to the second largest city in the United States, <laughs> not knowing a single person and said, I'm going to make a career in entertainment with like $2,000 in my pocket and said, I'm going to go make a career in entertainment and figure all this out without knowing a soul. And until the film was like actually released, half of my immediate friends and colleagues in Los Angeles and in Hollywood had no idea what my story really? was. Yeah, that's amazing. Because they didn't talk about it a lot. And that's right. not because I was trying to hide anything, but it was like, mm -hmm. uh, you know. How do you bring they, that conversation they, up? How do you bring that conversation up? Yeah, how do you do up? that? Right, how right, do you, right. And how also do you, you know, I mean, those who were close to me knew, right. but they didn't know right. the extent of what it was. Right. They just were like, okay, his dad killed his mom. That's pretty much it. I think they probably thought he shot her with a revolver. It was a crime of passion. I don't think they realized the seriousness of the crime being premeditated, right. the whole thing, right. the girlfriend, the pregnancy, all this. One of the, the, but I didn't want to let it define, define me. And of course, everybody comes out here too with this whole, oh, I'm going to tell my story. Everybody's got a script in their head when they sure. <laughs> come out here. So I think there was also that. But it, literally, I just remember friends of mine saying, hold on. So you made a move. So, you, but wait a minute. You were talking about this before. You're making a movie about your life, and blah, blah, blah. but you know everybody says that, but you actually did it. I was you like, did yeah. it, right? It was like pretty amazing. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty much what I did. Like that's why I'm right. here. And they're just right. like, I remember one of my friends saying to me, "He's like, you know, because it is very competitive, and it is very easy when you're an artistic career to become jealous of those around you." Because I'm sure. really jealous, envious of you, but at the same time, I'm really proud of you and I don't really yeah. know how to take that I was like yeah. oh, whatever man it's all good I mean I'll you know I'll take maybe not doing a movie about my mother being murdered by my father right. I'll you know <laughs> and my response to it I, I think I could think of other things to to uh, yeah. do creatively but you sure know, I, I was looking for this escape so again I feel like and I think the the biggest takeaway for me saying all this and having you here right now is you know the thing with the podcast, with the film, is that I wanted to show people that I wanted to give them a voice and an understanding that you can make it through seemingly insurmountable odds and That's defy, right. you know, take on a profoundly tragic situation and make it past these insurmountable odds and do right. something positive with your life, which is what resonates exactly. with, them, with people with the film, with the podcast, that see me on social media, with my work, right? Um, and it's a real privilege to be able to do that. Uh, but Absolutely. again, it goes back to my thing of, you know, how do I hate someone who I feel destroyed my life and save, saved my life right. at the same time? Right. Also, I feel like 
what do you say to someone that is going through a similar circumstance, whether it be abuse, neglect, uh, physical, whether their their spouse has, been, has murdered someone or, or, or whatever that is, right? And having come through the pandemic, dealing with all these mm-hmm. things that we've, you know, been locked up with people for a year and a half, two years. Sure. Um, well, now two years, I guess. We allow uh, family we, members passing with this too. Passing, I mean, I think it, it it's also this. changing with this. Right, right. And holding on to this this grief and this anger, um, sure. how do you, I mean, this, this show is called Moving Past Murder. What is the best piece of advice that you could give someone who is trying to move past their own tragic circumstances? Right. I just think there's not a simple one. I think it almost always, in, it, the, the best way of looking at it is you got to tell your story. If it is as remarkable as your story and you have the opportunity to tell it in the manner that you did, that's wonderful. I think of that, if you don't mind, I'll share from a little of my family. My my brother-in-law and sister-in-law had a daughter who had autism. And uh, on her 17th year of life, she committed suicide. And just simply, she couldn't deal with it any longer. So the family decided, particularly my brother-in-law, Darren is his name, uh, Darren and Stacy both decided they were gonna do something about it. So they developed this wonderful network in Atlanta called Aaron's Hope for Friends. And it's all based on that same perspective. So the second portion of it is turn that tragedy in some way of representing ways that you could help others. And, and that's why I think your dad helped you because I'm, I'm sure you would have been this way anyway, but it gave you a wonderful, powerful platform to help others. Because, you know, when we think of trauma, oh, my gosh, all the trauma that this pandemic has caused and loss of family members. But, you know, I know you've had other talks about people growing up with abuse and sexual abuse and and the yeah. prospect is one in four girls go through those experiences. The numbers are terrifying. One in six boys. So lots of trauma is built into people's lives. And one of the things that I realized and worked with kids with trauma as they become adults moving to trauma, I have a keen awareness, a keen empathy of what it means to suffer. And when I do that, then I develop better compassion and I develop a better way of seeing the community as a value to me. I make it sound easy, it isn't, because we can get swallowed up by the trauma. You know, probably times in your life where you felt that trauma swallowing you up. Sure. It's just not getting so lost that you don't lose the perspective about what you're capable of doing. We are remarkable and you are because you went through it. And I'm sure many people say, oh my gosh, I could never go through all that stuff that you've been through. And yet faced with challenges that people go through different clearly than what you've been through, people find their way. They have that capacity. And I think that's the core of it. And why is it, I think, more evident for you? I think I think Noreen made it so evident that loving and caring and being concerned as much as she was concerned for you, as much as she was concerned for you, you utilize that platform to help others going through trauma and challenge. So telling your stories first, tell your story and however you want to do it, however you need to do it. Realize that, like you said, it's sad. You can't get away from that. But the reality is if I can translate that into something that makes a difference in one other person's life, maybe I help yeah. someone who's gone through something similar, not as remarkable as the platform that you use, but if I can help one person, then it's been great. I would bet that you have helped many people. Who, you know, you've heard from many of them, but you hear from a lot. You don't hear from all the people that you've helped with what you have done. That's the most important piece. The important piece is saying, I know what he's saying. I know he can get to the other side of it because I see where he's going with this in his life. Maybe that's what I need to see within my own. I won't make a movie, but I'll talk to someone who's been hurt. I'll understand someone's hurt. It's amazing. Empathy comes out of those experiences that we have. Oh, you now, there are some people that are naturally empathic, but the sense of being aware of others and going through those challenges, because I know my own challenge. And I think that's fair to say that you, when you see people hurting, it t- touches into that core of your own hurt. I, I honestly think that that's, that's a really important piece that trauma can give us to help us understand Two things. One, we're much tougher than we give ourselves credit for. We're much more authentic and genuine. We can do this. But the second component is when I see somebody in pain, I really have a connection with them. And it's at a level that you can't, right? And I don't know, I should ask you that. Probably that's a good question for you to answer. But it's at a level that you can't just simply put in words. Oh, I know what you've been through. Yeah, I I also quit drinking or I also did these things. You have a sense of knowing what pain is. 
And that's why you're never going to forget this, because it does become a core of your compassion and concern for others. And and I think that that's really the key of it is connecting at a level that, that a lot of people don't know how to connect at. But it makes a difference in one person's life and in many people's lives in your case. I mean, that's all I ever wanted to do is, yeah. to, you know, heal myself and impact one person's life. And the, right. the fact of the matter is, is that it's been, you know, many hundreds, yeah. if not thousands of people that have reached out and said, I would also add was, one more agenda piece for you, knowing you as long as I have. I also think you want to make your mom proud. Yeah. I do, <laughs> you know, and, and, and without a doubt, I mean, I, I, I knew her fairly well when you were at school and I remember when she paraded your, your sister around and how powerful that was for her to have this darling little one in your lives, but she was so remarkably proud of you. And I, and I do think knowing her, uh, she, she's so very proud of you, Collier, for using this platform to deal with these very traumatic events. She, she is. There's no doubt in my mind. Uh, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Sure. Well, as you can see, um, there was a lot of that uh, episode that got kind of emotional. Getting sort of Dennis's insight and, you know, having had him be a part of the film, right? And then talking to him a few years later, like I just did, to really get his insight and also to find out, it's, it's so wonderful to hear because he did know my mother and many people in my community knew my mother. And to hear, um, you know, one of how proud he thinks that she would be of me, but which is touching, I know. But um, to hear that when he said, you know, towards the beginning of the episode, how everybody was very concerned about me and um, how I was coping and how he felt that um, how fragile I was. Everybody was concerned. Is he going to fall apart? And just how he got to know me in just that short interaction that we had that day that I wasn't fragile, that I was upset, obviously because of what happened to my mother, obviously I'm going to be grieving, but the fact that it was, um, that I struck him that way, that I, I was so kind of composed as a child. It's, it's so, I, I can't tell you how bizarre it is to hear that and how rewarding it is too, but, but how it's like, when I look back on that time period, how amazing it is to hear that. And I remembered something that I didn't mention in the episode to him because he mentioned something about me having a sense of humor. And I remember him specifically saying on that day, if you could change anything or if you could have anything right now, what would it be? And I remember him, I remember saying to him in my very sort of snarky 11 year old self way, well, I'll take a DeLorean if you have one alluding to back to the future and having a, <laughs> having a doc Brown's uh, DeLorean to go back in time to change anything and save my mother's life. Cause that's what I wanted to do. I wish that I had at that time, you know, I, I was experiencing a lot of emotions where I wish that I had gotten out of bed when I saw my father's footsteps or when I heard those two loud thuds, which was her being murdered. I mean, that was my reaction that I could have saved my mother. Now, as an adult, I realized that was like impossible. First of all, I was 11 years old. I was heavily asthmatic and my father was six foot three and 200 some pounds and obviously in a fit of rage. I mean, you have to be in such a you have to be in such a mental state to really execute something like that. At least that's how I feel. Um, so obviously my, my rationale that I could have stopped the murder is utterly fanciful. <laughs> um, but nonetheless, I was feeling like that as a, as an 11 year old child. And that's why I wanted the time machine to go back in time. Um, but I've made peace with that, obviously. Um, but yeah, I think that um, it, it was really, it's really good to hear his insight dealing with sociopaths and narciss narcissists. I hope that this really, uh, you know, because a lot of you have been asking for this. So I hope that his insights really have helped you uh, as they've helped me for sure. But, you know, again, I'm trying to 
I am developing content that I find interesting, but I hope that you guys find interesting. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. DM me on social medias, on my Instagram, my Twitter, Facebook. There is a, you know, again, I have a Patreon set up now, patreon.com forward slash Collier Landry. You can go there, see extra bits of the episodes, um, uh, the episode archive, obviously all ad free. And also these wonderful little tidbits of my life behind the scenes, things of that nature. Um, but again, like I want to hear from you guys. I'm developing this content. I want to know what you guys think about what I'm doing and how, if this episode really helped you or not. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing those com comments. Again, I'm looking forward to seeing you guys every Tuesday, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern time on my Instagram lives at Call Your Landry on Instagram and all those wonderful things. So uh, on that note, I'm Call Your Landry and this is Moving Past Murder. Thanks, y'all. This podcast is made possible by support from listeners just like you. Please subscribe via Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Audible. Find us on YouTube, youtube.com forward slash Collier Landry. The film A Murder in Mansfield is available on Investigation Discovery, Discovery Plus, and Amazon Prime Video. This podcast is a production of Don't Touch My Radio in association with RSA Entertainment. Please visit mpmpodcast.com to show your support today.